Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, it's a webinar <laughs> where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state and actually across the country. Um, these sessions are free to anyone who wants to attend and watch our live sessions and our recordings afterwards. We do them live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, so if you're available then, come and join us. Otherwise, we do um, have recorded all of our shows going back to January 2009 when we first started. So you can go on our website and watch any of our recordings if you cannot join us at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, um, presentations, mini training sessions, interviews, basically anything we think that might be of um, interest and vaguely related to libraries, we'll put you on the show. <laughs> um, and we have commission staff that do some of these presentations, and we also bring in guest speakers as we have this morning. Um, this morning on the line, we have with us Michael Porter. Hi, Michael. Hello. Hello. Um, and he is, I've got a longish uh, um, bio for him here, librarian, presenter, author, practical technology fan, and the most important thing, of course, a Pez collector. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but he is also the, um, he has previously worked at the Bill and the Gates Foundation, OCLC, Web Junction, um, Allen County Public Library. So he's been all over and everywhere in all sorts of different capacities, library related. Um, currently, he is the CEO of Library Renewal, which is a great organization that he and a whole group of people have put together to um, help libraries research, um, dedicated to research partnerships and grassroots support for libraries who are struggling to offer electronic content to their users. Um, e-books, e-anything, it's a big deal out there, obviously. Um, and this great organization, Library Renewal, at libraryrenewal.org. Um, Michael is in charge of that and to help libraries um, figure out what to do with all this. Um, today, though, he is going to speak to us about um, renewal in general. So I will um, hand over to you, Michael, and if you want to give a more, uh, a different intro, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, explanation of who you are and what you do you can otherwise you can just go ahead and take it away okay thank you very much Krista mm -hmm. um, uh, before we get started I did want to thank you Krista for all the work and help that you've provided in getting ready for the webinar you've been a joy to work with and I know everybody on the line here is probably familiar with your work you do a great well, job so thank, thank you Thank you very much. We're, I was very pleased to get you on the show, and um, especially, I didn't mention this, that everyone may not know, Michael's way over on the West Coast, so it's, it's 8 a.m. for him over there, correct? <laughs> yeah. A little bit <laughs> earlier than us. <laughs> that, it's okay. I do lots of presentations all over, and, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm used to doing one or two days where I don't get too much sleep. I tend to, uh, you know, just to fess up to everybody, I tend to procrastinate that style actually it works pretty well when I'm making presentations for me mm -hmm. so it's no problem yeah. at all. It's, <laughs> okay. it's all good. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah well thanks for having <laughs> me I appreciate it. It's actually it, it is an honor every time I get to present so mm -hmm. everyone that's attending or watching the archive thank you very much for taking the time. There are a lot of ways you could spend your time and I've, I've tried pretty hard to give you a presentation that is worth your time uh, and uh, make it appealing to to you regardless of sort of where you are, what kind of library you're in, and, and have it be applicable and hopefully a little inspiring even. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess, Krista, if it's all right with you, I'll jump in here. Yeah, go right ahead. It. Take it away. Yep. Cool. Okay, so hi, everybody. I'm Mike Porter. <laughs> We're here to talk about renewal, as Krista said. Um, and I want to talk about uh, how you could renew yourself, your library, and your career um, as a part of the work that you do. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for lots of uh, powerful impact, and we want to talk about how you, you, I'm talking to you, <laughs> can actually uh, make some of that good stuff happen and get some more potential realized for the library through you and your work. So let's talk more about that. I thought we'd do an introduction first. Uh, uh, bu 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 let's see here. There we go. All right. Sorry, I had a little get my slide movement here figured out. All right. So, hi, I'm Michael Porter. <laughs> and just in case any of you were wondering, I'm not this Michael Porter, the 
the uh, the inspirational uh, gospel singer from uh, the early '80s. Um, though I, I do know that some people feel like they should thank God for the internet because they can dig up pictures like this. So that's not me. That's me. I'm this Michael Porter. Uh, and you know, this is the Michael Porter that's worked in library land for 20 years. And you know, I I try to take a picture every year or so when I'm I'm at work, just so you can see how things change as the years go by. I'll just tell you, usually, you know, when I'm in person and I show the slides, I get this slide, I get a laugh. Um, so hopefully, some of you got a chuckle out of this. I'll also tell you, uh, we've got about an hour together, and we have 140 slides. And I know I do this as well. I like to multitask when I watch presentations, but. I will tell you if you if you multitask this, you're going to miss 140 pretty spiffy slides. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, I've worked in library land for 20 years. Um, you know, I also had this strange job once where I got to travel all over the world to dozens and dozens and dozens of countries, and I got to visit libraries all over the world, and it was incredibly inspiring. Every every port we went to, I would stop and I would find the library and and visit the library and see if I could talk with folks there. It was just a fabulous experience. So uh, in traveling all over the world, seeing uh, lots and lots and lots of libraries, um, I, I couldn't help but just love libraries. Just It's the power, the impact, uh, and the potential of libraries is so clear globally. Uh, but you know, before I had this job, I worked for the Gates Foundation in the US Library Program, and uh, I was on the road for two out of three weeks for four years. And that let me work with thousands of library staffers, hundreds and hundreds of different libraries, actually in the libraries in 33 different states. So I loved libraries before. I understood why libraries were important. But going to all of these locations, including several libraries in Nebraska, <laughs> I might add, uh, it was just impossible not to see the care and passion that uh, library staffers were putting in to make these institutions work in their local communities. It was one of the most powerful experiences of my life uh, and I was already motivated to work and try to help libraries and help library staff but with this job and with the job that I had seeing libraries all over the world um, hopefully as you get to know me here uh, <laughs> as your presenter since I'm yapping at you for an hour uh, you'll understand that this comes from a, a a place that has a little experience behind it and also has uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, and I would say there's a lot of uh, belief in my heart as well about this. So uh, when I say things about you and your work in your library, um, I don't know you perhaps individually. I don't know your exact job or what your boss is like or what the politics in your library are like, but I do know how libraries work and I, I've tried really hard to get some fairly simple things and some inspiration, some stories together today to help you find ways that you could renew yourself, your library, and your career, uh, and hopefully get some pretty exciting, fun, and interesting things done. The things that you enjoy as well as provide lots of benefit for the community. Okay, so, you know, caring about libraries so much, I think a lot about what made libraries work. How did we get here? What made us and our institutions so successful in every community around this country. Uh, it's you know there are more libraries than McDonald's and Starbucks and, and it's that's significant. There's real there's something there, and, and I, we're going to talk about that a little more. And I know we know the reasons, but uh, it's sometimes nice to think about some of them specifically. So I think a lot about that, but I also think a lot about um, the fact that some of what made libraries work for the past hundred years. Uh, or more, they're not working quite as well. Some of those things, now many of the things, and we're going to talk about this, um, uh, the things that underlie all of our work are the same uh, as far as principles go. Um, but some of the actual duties and tasks and services, those are evolving in ways that, that, that aren't, don't really mesh with uh, some, of the, some of the traditional services we've offered to accomplish our missions and work towards the principles that libraries are built to further. So I guess all in all, as we're getting to know each other here, as I introduce myself to you, I would say I'm very concerned for libraries, love libraries, I'm also hopeful for libraries though. 
Uh, and you know, I, also I will say it's one of the few things that really, truly, I get pretty patriotic about. Um, and now to some of you that might sound awesome, some of you it might sound hokey. Um, I, it, I, I've seen enough of libraries in this country, in this world, to understand that uh, it's really important to democracy and to uh, the communities that we all live in. So I'm very concerned about libraries. In fact, I'm concerned enough that uh, I left my job and started working full time with a group of libraries all around the country and uh, individual librarians all around the country to start a nonprofit called Library Renewal. And just very briefly, uh, we're going to talk a little more about Library Renewal later, but we were created specifically to further the mission of libraries as it relates to e-content. So that's what we focus on as an organization. And we are working to build a new e-content acquisition and distribution infrastructure with transparent pricing for libraries. The idea is uh, uh, libraries would control this system and understand exactly what the price points were and any fees or anything would be explicitly explained and the cost would be minimized because we're a nonprofit run by libraries deciding what fair prices were for any of the services uh, that the organization that we would create together through the organization. It's a different model uh, and we've been working on it for a couple of years. Uh, it's a gigantic task. There are, there's lots of movement with e-content right now in that market, but uh, we believe strongly that we have something to offer, and as you'll see later, if you want to talk to us about that, you can. So let's talk about renewal for a second. You know, thinking about this presentation and how to make it valuable for you and your work in your library, um, it really dawned on me that I'm a real advocate for renewal. Uh, and I also uh, advocate for it enough that I really believe I, you can do it. There's a lot that you can do. So when we think about renewing yourself, your library, and your career, I believe that you can do it. And hopefully by the time we're through this presentation, you'll feel even more like that than perhaps you do now. Before we get into the meat of things here, let's just start off with the definition of the word renew, the root word of renewal. Uh, uh, so, as a transitive verb, renew <laughs> means several things, and I pulled the definitions that I mean when we're talking about renewing yourself, your library, and your career. To make like new, to restore uh, to freshness, vigor, or perfection, <laughs> to make new spiritually or regenerate, right? To restore to existence, revive, to make extensive changes, or to rebuild, to replace, or repl replenish. That's what we're talking about with renewal. Look, I know you have a hard job. I know it. I, I, I before I went to library school, I worked for ten years in a, in a library system. This was a larger system. Had thirteen branches in the system. Worked in the main library in circulation. I, I worked extra hours in the systems office. Then I moved over to the children's department, and then I moved to the biggest, busiest branch to be a reference librarian. Um, so I, and I, by the way. Numerically, most of the folks in the country that call themselves librarians don't have master's degrees, um, and, and I, I believe in the importance of a master's degree, but I also understand that um, many of the best librarians in the country don't have master's degrees. Um, uh, many of the best librarians in the country do, of course, um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in people that are committed and working really hard uh, and doing all they can to understand how libraries work, the principles of librarianship how to really be good librarians to serve their community through the institution of the library. So uh, uh, if I say librarian, um, I, I do mean you. Uh, I mean library staff. Uh, so uh, uh, just so you know, sometimes there's a little distinction when people present, and I just want to make that clear. I agree with you totally on your definition and explanation of a, a librarian, Michael. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and, you know, certainly there's respect for the work that I and you and lots of other folks have done getting the master's degrees, but there's, after having that job with the Gates Foundation and just seeing hundreds of libraries and librarians that hadn't, they wanted to do that, but they couldn't, but were absolutely committed to doing as much as they could uh, to understand what it meant to be a librarian. Um, you know, not everybody is like that. Some people, it's just a job, uh, and they're just grinding out the time. Uh, we're going to actually talk about that a little bit as we move forward, uh, because I believe there's opportunity even for you folks for renewal. <laughs> okay, so I have a challenge, or you could say a dare for you, and I mean you. <laughs> Here's what it is. 
uh, I dare you <laughs> to come up with an idea. And I mean uh, an idea for a project at your library. And, and I mean a project that you really want to do, something that you're really excited about. Um, uh, let's say uh, you are uh, in a larger library and you work at the desk and you would like to do a display. Now look, I'm not saying this would fly at your library, you'd be allowed to do this, but maybe you want to try this project. Um, uh, that could be an idea. Uh, if you work in a real small library and aren't open very many hours, uh, maybe you want to try some sort of reading group that you haven't done before. I don't know. It's not, it's not my idea. It's your idea. Something that you could do in your library that you would really enjoy working on that would get you excited uh, and be a little different from what you usually do. So that's my challenge to you is to come up with an idea, something that you're really excited about. And then the next step of that challenge is for me to dare you or challenge you to make that happen. Now, I know lots of folks are saying, oh, no, 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 you don't know what it's like, I'm too busy, I don't, no, no, I can't do something like that. Well, let's not talk about that yet. We're going to talk about that. But despite the fact that you might be saying, stop this, no, 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 I'm not going to do anything different, what are you talking about? Uh, let's, let's, let's just, for this, at this point, let's just decide we're going to go ahead and make it happen. And when I say we're going to make it happen, I really mean you're going to make it happen. You. I would encourage you to now go do it. So I dare you, in order to make this happen, to do three things to make this happen. Make a strategy. What do you want to do? What does it mean? What are the consequences? Make a strategy for making that happen. And then define tactics, the actual things you'll do to make your strategy for this project, this idea that you want to make happen in your library really happen, and then assign a timeline to it. Then I want you to write all that down and keep thinking about it. So I dare you to do this. I dare you <laughs> to come up with an idea that you really like, that you really want to do, something a little different in your library. It doesn't have to be gigantic. It could be gigantic. And then make a strategy, tactics, and a timeline for it. Write all that down. Keep thinking about it. Get it stuck in your head. Maybe you're in the shower, right? Just drifting off to sleep. That's sometimes that's and maybe that's not what you want to think about when you drift off to sleep. But <laughs> this is my challenge to you. Come up with this idea, create a strategy, tactics, and a timeline, write them down, keep thinking about them, and then refine those plans. Now, we're going to talk more about this, but we're going to talk about why this is a challenge that I'm issuing to everybody listening today and why I think that it can actually work. So this is meant to be encouraging, not to be, it might, it's a little, maybe a little cheesy here, but uh, it's meant to be sort of, yeah, let's go do this. Like, not like rah, rah, everything's great when it's not, but, you know, you can go do this. And I know. So look, let's go back to this. I know a lot of folks are saying, stop. Oh, stop it. You don't know what it's like in my library. And I know, truthfully, a lot of folks are saying this. No, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. Uh, sometimes there are reasons to say stop, 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 stop. However, I will say that I am of the opinion that sometimes, sometimes in library land, this attitude of stop, 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 stop. No, 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 no. It can be a little rampant, and it might not be the most popular thing for me to say, but I have seen this over and over again. There, and it's not just libraries, right? It's human nature. Sometimes you can get stuck in a rut with coworkers, with management, with politics that just say stop, 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 and before you know it, you have that attitude too. And I'm not saying all of you have that attitude, um, but I I know it's something that can happen. So I know some of you are thinking, I'm not going to think of some new idea. It's not going to happen. And more than that, no, 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 no. I know some of you are thinking, forget this. You don't understand. You don't know what it's like, Michael Porter. Who, who are you to come in and say this? Forget it. Forget it. I'm overworked. I'm underpaid. Besides, I'm not the one in the library that has authority. I, and, you know, look, I know some, of, some people think, maybe not some of you attending, maybe. May, very well maybe some of you might just think you know what I have a crappy job and I don't like my job some of you are thinking you've tried something like this before and it didn't work or some of you might just feel deflated oh, oh you know I don't get listened to I'm or maybe you might not say it but you might think it when you're being really frank I'm scared to do something different and you know I know there will be people that hear this message and think you know what I don't have to listen to you. What, what do you know? And, and by the way, who are you to come in and tell me to come up with some idea, some vague program to make some idea and some plan and tactics? Okay. 
Well, look, uh, you know, I get it. I understand that these are all challenges. Uh, I also understand that at your library, you might want to do something that you might not be able to make work. It just might not fly at your library. I get that. Uh, however, as we're going to talk about, that doesn't actually mean that you can't do things that are different, that move your library in the direction it needs to go, uh, that let you play to your strengths and do things that you really enjoy and really want to work on. I know that that's true because I've done it and I know dozens and dozens and dozens of other folks that have done it as well. So I'm not trying to be all sis boom ba <laughs> rah 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 uh, when you shouldn't be like that. I'm trying to be realistically optimistic uh, and that's something we're going to talk about as we move forward. So let's talk a little more about, you know, like look, okay, Michael Porter who thinks he can waltz in here and talk to folks in Nebraska about how they need to do some new project something different, something that maybe breaks the mold a little bit that they're really excited to work on that they might not be able to even get approval to do. Uh, why would I even want to bother doing that? Well, let's talk more about why you would want to bother to do something a little different, something that got you excited about your job, that maybe helped your library deliver a service that needs to be delivered more effectively. Why would you want to bother to do that? Well, here's the first thing. Look, you, you, each one of you, you have more power. We. We have more power individually to affect positive change than many of us realize. And I don't care what your job is in the library. I believe this. I, I believe this because, in part, I've been able to do some things like this. And the reason I've been able to do things like this is because dozens and dozens of people have held my hand and taught me and mentored me and worked with me. I know it's possible. And just in case any of you are wondering, my slides are advancing automatically for some reason. It's very strange. I'm not sure what's going on, but um, if I seem to skip around a little bit, that's what's going on. So, despite that, <laughs> I believe that you have more power and ability than you may realize. And I'm serious about this. You, you, each one of you. Uh, and to, to exemplify that, I would just say, you know, here's a slide. Insert image of heroes. Um, there are lots of heroes that were brought to their heroic deeds through uh, circumstance, certainly. But, uh, or maybe the position or wealth or fame of their family, and then they decided to do some of the right things that made it easier for them to be heroes that we know of. But most heroes are just everyday heroes. And most heroes, you know heroes that I don't know. And I would say, I have seen this. I have, working in the children's department, a very large children's department, 300,000 items in the whole department. This is a big children's department. I've seen hundreds of kids that, saw the librarians in that department as heroes, and it's part of what motivates me. And sometimes, you know, I can get a little choked up thinking about this. I remember those little kids who were so shy and scared and had horrible lives, and they would come in the library, and after seeing me there every day for a year or two, they would finally give me a hug. And you just knew they didn't have anybody else in their life like that. And it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It didn't have, you know, yeah, sure, it was good that I was there, but there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of us around the country doing this work every day. That's a hero to me. That's a hero to that little kid. And So my point here is that you could stick your image in here. Really, doing your job. And you know what? I don't care what your job is at the library when I'm saying this. You could be the executive director of a multi-library system. You could be a shelver. Uh, you could work in the maintenance department. Uh, you could be the one woman that runs everything in a one-room library. And I know several of you may very well be in each of those positions. Um, I believe you have potential to renew your library through your work. And I believe that if you find something that is very appealing to you, that you're interested in doing, that is different, uh, that is a little experimental perhaps, um, you're going to be more motivated, and you're going to have a better chance of success at it. So, really, you, I believe you have the power to do this. So, let's, you know, still, though, I know some people are saying, stop, 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 but you, know, you don't get it, dude. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little more about why we should bother to try some new project that we really believe in and want to make happen to further the mission of our library, to make our library more successful. Why bother doing something new? I'm too busy already, right? Well, uh, your library serves a role in the community no other institution does. It's rare, it's important, it's wonderful, and truthfully, when things are so motivated by money and other issues and we're all so busy and we have families and lives, it's pretty amazing that the library exists. 
and it exists because you make it all happen. Your work makes this happen. Really, again, you, you and your work do this. Uh, here's another reason why you should bother, because communities need libraries to thrive. And you know, when I present about libraries, I always have this slide in my presentations, li this equation, libraries equal content plus community. If you think about what libraries do, we're about content access, uh, helping people find the right content, and engaging with our community to make sure this institution facilitates access to content and community. Now, we're, clearly, this could be a lot more. We could talk about wisdom and knowledge and uh, all different kinds of community. There's, there's, there's a lot more to this, but this is an important role that no other institution in society fills. You know, here's another example of why you should bother. This is a film that was made shortly after World War II finished, uh, and it's about democracy. Uh, it was an instructional video, uh, and I took some screenshots. In this video, they described some of the conditions for democracy, and two of those are economic balance and enlightenment. Well, what is the library there for? Everybody can use it. It's the free public library, and enlightenment because, well, <laughs> that's what happens when you read, <laughs> when you learn, when you engage with your community through content at your library. So it's important for you to bother trying to push limits and do things that really get you excited and inspired and motivated because you further the conditions of democracy through the only institution in your community that's set up to do it the way we're set up to do it. Now, there are also a couple signs of democracy that were in this, uh, present this video that I took screenshots of right after World War II is when it was made. Uh, shared respect and shared power. So uh, enlightenment involves knowledge, certainly. You have to get knowledge before you can be enlightened. Uh, and if, you know, we all know the axiom, knowledge is power, right? If you think about the equal access that libraries are absolutely committed to, that's all about shared power. And we're also completely about shared respect, right? We care about our community, and we want our community to be uplifted, to become richer. And that could be financially, certainly, but that could be emotionally. That could be, we're going to talk more about this in a variety of ways. So when you think about why you should bother maybe trying something new or getting more a little excited about a specific project that you could actually do something on and maybe you know, get more energy and, and positive things going on just in your head even sometimes. Uh, there are reasons to do this because you have a job at the library. The library is so important to democracy and to this country and to your community. Uh, it's important that we do things like this. And you know, not to be all you know, super uber patriotic, but this is something that is pretty exciting and pretty rare. Uh, and it is something that's pretty great. And so I would just say, if anybody ever asks why we still need libraries when we have Google, Apple, or Amazon, remember what we've been talking about, these principles and conditions of democracy, the role that your job fills in society, and the fact that 15 years ago, Google didn't exist. Imagine that. That's crazy. So if somebody says, well, why do I need the library when I can do searches on Google? OK, well, uh, if you know, companies come, I, look, I don't know this will or won't happen, right? But uh, uh, Google could go out of business. They're not baked into the fabric of democracy, but libraries are. And we need to perpetuate that. And when I think, personally, think about how technology is evolving and how people need to get things electronically and how horribly expensive and difficult it is for people to get things electronically through the library, I'm very concerned about the future of libraries. Concerned enough that, look, hey, I'll put my money where my mouth is. I worked with, it took years to work on this, and we're still, we've got a long way to go. Believe me, we've got a long way to go. Uh, and it's not always easy, but uh, I, I cared enough about this to seek out a couple dozen other folks that could either come and get involved individually or with their library to help create a new system for libraries to control the cost and pricing and access to their e-content. Now look, I'm not just pushing library renewal, I'm just telling you, like, if you're saying, well, I can't do that, look, who the heck am I to try to do something like that? Really, truly. <laughs> That's why you, I got more people involved, and you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. What I'm trying to say right now is, your role, your job is incredibly important, and it's going to stay important. And the way you're going to engage and move things forward is by doing things, for example, what we've been talking about here, is finding a project you're really excited in, 
making a smart plan, and then following through on that plan to try to make that happen. Here's another reason why you should bother. This is the average income for the bottom 90% of us. These are households. The average income for the bottom 90% of households is just $1,000 a year. That's not a lot of money. 90% of the people in this country need libraries. And as technology evolves, if libraries aren't playing in that environment where people want to get things lickety split, what they want, when they want, how they want it, if they can't do that through the library, that's a huge problem for democracy, for the country. Uh, and you know, I got to tell you, just be selfish for your job. You want to keep your job? We got to try doing some different things. And I believe all the stuff I've been telling you, you can do it. And I'm, I'm outlining a, sh a simple plan for you to, to try a project. And you know, I'll also tell you, you try one project, that can spawn into another project and another project. And before you know it, you're helping to ensure that libraries can be around to serve these people that desperately need what the library offers that they can't get anywhere else. And you know, that's not, look, I'm not, I'm not mad at the people that make bucket loads of money all the time. They use the library too. They should. We, we like those folks. We, they're a part of our community as well. Um, but numerically, when you look at split, there's a powerful reason for us to try to get things moving forward in our libraries. And you know, here's another reason why you should bother to try to put some energy into trying some new project to renew yourself professionally, or your library, or your career, uh, or your community through some project you might want to take on. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm, many of you, probably all of you, have seen this and studied this in school. And basically, as you know, at the bottom, right? These are things that you know you have to have these things at the bottom before you can move to the next level and then to the next level, and the next level, and the top is self-actualization. So like, look, if you can't breathe and don't have food and water, right, you're not going to be doing any of these other things. And, you know, think about this list, though, sleep, sex, homeostasis, excretion. Now, look, I realize we're in polite company, but when you think about this stuff, uh, the, we have things in the library about this, right? And go to the next level, security of body, employment, resources, morality, the family health problem. Like, look, we have things in our library about all of this stuff. So when you think about how the library fits into people's lives, right, all of this stuff comes into play. Let's talk a little more about why you should bother. Let's talk about the principles of libraries and librarianship. So libraries are designed around specific principles. Your job is designed around specific principles. I asked about these principles on Facebook, uh, I guess a couple months ago now, and I got this huge thread of responses. People were very interested to chime in about this question, about how you would describe the principles of librarianship. Uh, and in that discussion, I was pointed to some work that two different groups of libraries had volunteered to come and work together on as a committee, two committees, uh, to come up with the core values of librarianship. And these core values are listed here. Access, confidentiality, privacy, democracy, diversity, education, lifelong learning, intellectual freedom, preservation public good, professionalism, service, and social responsibility. And I can tell you, these were debated ad nauseum twice by two different committees. I feel pretty good about this list. And in fact, when I asked the folks, and on the left there you can see a little mini picture of all of the comments people chimed in with, uh, these things came up. They came up and they were phrased a little differently. This is a pretty darn good list of things. We're the only institution committed to all of these things, specifically all of these things. Uh, and we need to do all we can to further them. Because humanity needs these principles. They're critical to society. They bring hope. They lift people up. And it's right in the blood and the genes of the library. Uh, our very existence as institutions and your job, your job was created around these principles. I'm not, to me, that's powerful stuff. That's amazing stuff. And, you know, there you go. <laughs> it's a grand old flag, I guess. <laughs> At least when it comes to the libraries, that's for sure. Okay, you and your work makes all of this happen. So these are fancy, you know, shiny words here, but it's true. So, you know, when I think about the United States, sure, I love the United States, but I love libraries more. Uh, and I believe that it's important for you to think about ways to renew yourself, your library and career. And it's important for you to think realistically about ways that you can do this. You can renew yourself, your library, and your career. So I am going to say you can do it, but I'm going to say that with some tempering. Tempering that is uh, realistic optimism. I consider myself a realistic optimist, and I would encourage you to be a realistic optimist as well. 
So this is a slide I have in all my presentations. Just because you're optimistic doesn't mean you're naive. But there are some schools of thought that think that if I just believe that success is going to come to me, and it can come to me easily, I can just believe it and it'll happen. Look, it's important to believe in things, uh, uh, but there's more to it than that. Just believing that success will come easily to you is not going to make it happen, as our friend Dwight would tell us. So I'm going to—I have some quotes here, and, and I don't—I don't usually do this, but these are really good stories, and so I'm—we're I'm, going to walk through these, and, and uh, uh, there are some really important lessons here about you get about how to be realistically optimistic. So you're not going to be some schmuck who's just all smiling, everything's great all the time, constantly. But you're going to be realistic, but you're going to be optimistic because that's the only way you're going to move things forward successfully. And that's the way you're also going to get the most value out of your work. You're going to get uh, uh, a better feeling in your head about what you're working on as well. So realistic optimists, they believe they'll succeed, but they also believe that they have to make the success happen. They don't just believe that it's going to, they just believe in it and it's going to happen. That's not enough. You have to make it happen just as you believe it will happen. Uh, one way you might say this is luck takes discipline. Um, this is a, one of the library renewal posters, and I opened my beer on the bottom of the beer cap. It said luck takes discipline. I thought that was great. Um, so that's sort of what they're saying. You, know, you have to believe you're going to succeed, but you have to make that success happen. It takes effort and really careful planning and persistence and choosing the right strategies. So when we started this presentation and I challenged you, I dared you to come up with some idea about some project something you want to do at your library to move its mission forward that's not getting done, that you're really excited about. And then, right, we've been talking about how we need a strategy and we need tactics, we need a timeline, and then we need to review that and think about it and you know, get it nice and healthy and then put it into action, right? Uh, that All of that takes effort, careful planning, persistence, and choosing the right strategies. So when we're talking about realistic optimism, we're not just talking about busy work, we're not just talking about uh, smiling and saying everything's great when it's not. We're not saying we're going to be able to do everything in the world. No, no, no. We're being realistically optimistic, and that is important and necessary in libraries, particularly right now. Here's a little story about Winston Churchill. His shortest speech ever. Here's what it is. It's not going to take long. Here's what it is. Never give in. You've heard it. Never, 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 and nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in. Accept to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. So this was right. This was when uh, uh, Hitler uh, had defeated all, all of the original eight allies except for Churchill's England. Um, now look, I'm not saying working in the library is like World War II. <laughs> uh, however, uh, there is an important point in that uh, things can seem pretty dark and you can still triumph. And I know some of you work in libraries where the politics are not good, and you are perhaps not given the amount of respect or freedom or capacity that you feel you deserve. There are ways you can move towards that. Um, there are lots of ways you can move towards that. It's critically important for you to be optimistic to make this happen uh, and to, for you to do as much good as possible for as many people as possible through the library. Um, you don't have to be all goofy and happy and smiley, right? But you have to be realistically optimistic. That's the path to getting those things that you want and need from your library and your career and for your community. So realistic optimists, they recognize the need for serious thought to how they will deal with obstacles, how we will deal with obstacles. And in giving thought to dealing with those opt obstacles, we'll be prepared. And that preparation then is just going to increase your confidence in your ability to get things done which will make you, in turn, more optimistic. Imagine that. Realistically optimistic, not just goofy optimistic, but realistically optimistic. So what that means really is that believing the road to success is going to be rocky, that's going to lead to greater success because you're prepared, you're expecting right these challenges, and you're expecting to take action on them. So really, people that are confident, this is a great quote, people who are confident that they will succeed and equally confident that success won't come easily, uh, they put in more effort, they plan how they'll deal with problems before they arise, and they persist longer in the face of difficulty. So being realistically optim optimistic 
when you're thinking about your project or the project after that or you know maybe the project after that uh, if you realize it's probably not going to come too easily you're going to put in more effort right and you're going to plan how you'll deal with problems even before they arise and you'll know that because you've done this work you're going to last longer as you're working through this stuff so this is the last quote I'm going to read to you cultivate your realistic optimism by combining a positive attitude with an honest assessment of the challenges that await you don't visualize success visualize the steps you will take in order to make success happen and this is by the woman that wrote this article this was in the Harvard Business uh, Review um, it's very short but very fine article uh, so you know let's go back I dare you to come up with an idea I dare you something you really want to do at your library that will maybe break some new ground I challenge you to make a strategy, tactics, and time. I dare you to do this. Do it. And then write it down. Think about it. Mull it over. Refine it. And then do it. Okay. I'm going to go through this maybe a little quickly. Um, because sometimes, you know, it's hard to think about motivation. And I want to tell you this story because um, it, it took me, and I still, something I still struggle with, being optimistic. Uh, I work for decades to try to train my brain to be realistically optimistic. I still struggle with it sometimes. You know, it's not always easy. Um, but as you work at doing this, you start to find uh, motivation and inspiration in places that are there right in front of you that you never saw before. It's like you train your brain to let it see treasure uh, that can help you and help you help other people. Um, and it just makes you happier in your head. So I want to, I, I do presentations, I do lots of presentations. I do presentations about the future of libraries, about technology, about ebooks, about design. I do, uh, that's my undergrad is in painting and sculpture. So, um, you know, there are a lot of principles of design that, that really apply to libraries. So I want to talk, just let me give you a story. Let me show you an example of how when you're realistically optimistic, the way you can think about things and how it might help shape some of the things you look at and motivate you. You'll find you get motivation throughout the day more and more to try to be like this. Uh, and you're going to need this because you're going to you know, start some project that's going to be challenging, maybe a little difficult for you. So let's talk about motivation through design. So I, you know, I'm in Seattle. So this is the Seattle Public Library. And you've probably seen this. You, many of you may have even been here. Um, it's kind of a funky building, uh, kind of a weird looking thing, huh? Uh, uh, it actually, uh, whether you think it is or not, is believed by most people that no architecture to be an incredibly beautiful and effective building. Uh, it has some challenges, of course, <laughs> as we've talked about, being realistically optimistic. And having talked with lots of librarians there, I'm familiar with many of the challenges, but, all, challenges, but familiar also with some of its pretty amazing successes. This can be motivating for you because <clears throat> there's a pretty powerful punchline. Punchline, that makes it sound like a joke. Pretty powerful climax to this story. Um, about getting motivated through design by this example at the Seattle Public Library. So uh, here's one of the ways that it's inspiring. This building brings in tens of millions of dollars every year to the city of Seattle for architectural tourism. People come to Seattle to see this building designed by Rem Koolhaas. Now, you might say, well, look at that lump. Why, am I, why is anybody going to come to see that? And some of you may already know it's beautiful and believe it's beautiful. Uh, I, I'm of that thought, but I understand that that's not necessarily what everybody thinks. There's a lot of reasons why. Let me tell you a few things about the building so it makes more sense. First of all, see how it juts out in funky ways down at the bottom on the left, at the top on the right? It does that because the architect wanted to have the building push out further so it could take advantage of views because where the library is, you can see mountains on both sides and you can see Puget Sound, but it's blocked by lots of buildings. So he wanted to take advantage of the actual location of the library so that people could go to a space in the library and use the views as they learn to make the library a more hospitable, welcoming, friendly, special, all those great things. So it might seem silly that that's got all that jutting out and clearly they made it very decorative, but uh, those, those things are there for a reason. They were designed very specifically to take advantage of the physical location of this building. Uh, that's pretty cool, right? Maybe it's not so goofy that it's like that. Maybe an initial reaction of, oh, gosh, that's ugly or stupid. And you might still think that, and that would be okay, right? We're allowed to have our opinions on that stuff. But understanding that there was lots and lots and lots of thought 
and purpose behind that. It's pretty important. Here's another interesting thing. This guy thought about the library, and he basically thought the library does five different things. You have administrative tasks, which he put in HQ, headquarters. Uh, you have all your materials and the way you access things, and he called that the spiral. We'll talk about that. Libraries also have, to have meeting places, and they have to have places for staff to work. And then you also have a place, they have to have a place for people to come in, uh, to enter, to sort of uh, start their experience of coming to the library, and frankly, just things like parking, right? So he broke the, the things that happen in the library very roughly down into departments, and the, those were the ways he broke them down. He, he also, uh, the spiral, so uh, using, uh, uh, using Dewey, decimal system, right? The spiral starts at zero at the top and sort of goes around and around down to 9.99. So, gosh, imagine you worked in a library like that. That's crazy. You can't run from the zeros to the 700s, right? <laughs> You're going to have to take an elevator. You're going to have to walk a lot. So they have librarians stationed. Now, all of this was designed, right? It's pretty amazing the amount of effort and time and thought that went into this. Even if you think it's goofy, even if you think it's a crazy idea, um, they had buy-in. They worked with the community, with the leaders, with the government, with the librarians like crazy. They worked with the librarians. Um, it's a pretty amazing story to think about this and how much effort and community buy-in went into this process. So here's an example of design and how they pieced all this together. In order to get from one section or the other or to get a librarian to help a patron in a specific area of the stacks, they had this basically VOIP walkie-talkie system that they have to do it. So they have all these little pieces that were carefully designed. This library, when you check your books in, it goes to a robot down in the basement that sorts the books and gets them ready to shelve. Uh, they designed all of these things for the library. And you know, look, it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes it breaks and you got to fix the robot. <laughs> design isn't perfect, right? <laughs> Sometimes things are going to go wrong and you got to work it. But the design itself actually ends up being pretty successful. And many people believe this to be a pretty beautiful library. You saw it from the outside. Here are some images of what it looks like from the inside. So you can see a lot of care and thought went into this. I'm going to show you some more, but I'm going to tell, I'm going to talk more about why am I bothering to show you all of this stuff and all these pictures of this one library. So look, see how all the careful design and thought went into this to use all the spaces to make it uh, as useful uh, and pretty <laughs> and appealing to users of the library. This is, there is significant effort, thought, every little thing about this building. So I'll just tell you, I, <clears throat> I'm pretty library geeky. I was watching when they had the architects pitch this on local public access television. Um, I watched the pre all the presentations from all the different architects that proposed building the new main library. And I, including Rem Koolhaas, this designer, who's a little quirky, he's one of those Starkitect guys, uh, uh, talk about all of this and how this would all work. Um, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, that they would put all of this money and effort and time and thought, and then that it would turn all this money back to the community every year through architectural tourism, and also that it would just be the library. So the library is filling even another role beyond the role it fills as a library. It's pretty powerful stuff. So uh, it also tells a story, and that story is pretty simple. That story is people believe that the library is important enough to make this happen. That's Wow, that says a lot. Even if you think it's a waste of money or it's ugly, uh, uh, lots of people don't. Enough people that they'll bring millions of dollars to this city every year, and, and that's a good thing. And it gets a lot of attention to the library, and that's a good thing because we need positive attention. Now, look, I realize this is – look, I know. I've been in a lot of what your libraries are like. I, I understand we're in an old building. It's run down. You might work 20 hours a week. This seems like beyond Disneyland. I get it. Um, but look at all the thought that went into this. Look at all the people that believed in this. Look at all the effort and care and money, money, money that went into this. Now, I realize this is a special situation, but it's pretty exciting. It's, it's, it's a pretty amazing. People really believe in these libraries so much that they would bother, even if it's just one place they bother to do something like this. Wow, that's pretty exciting. That might mean that if you get an idea and want to take some project that really excites you, that maybe is a little different, that you want to put effort and time in and make happen, gosh, you know, if this, they could do this and make that happen, what, what, you could do something. You could certainly do something. You could do a lot of somethings. 
so I guess that's that's part of what I meant is when you when you learn things and you, you look at, at things about how libraries are working and stories from libraries, uh, you can use that to inspire you to get you motivated. Um, and you know you can tell I like pictures. 140 slides an hour long presentation. I like pictures. Sure. Well. Look, I'm trying to keep me motivated too when I give these presentations, so I put lots of pretty pictures in, and the crowd seemed to like it. I, I hope you can see all the slides today. I hope it works on the webinar. But <laughs> um, you know, this, this is one of the ways I'm trying to make my work more enjoyable, so I stay motivated as well. So let me just say this. So thinking about how important libraries are, let's go back to your project that you might work on, um, and how important your work in libraries is to society. And you know, for me, I think about how technology is changing the landscape of libraries and access, um, and also then realizing that you can shape your own professional destiny uh, by doing things like what we've talked about, taking on a project. Uh, let's think about how you could design something libraries need, right? That's again the challenge or the dare that I put forward to you. And let me let's just talk a little bit more about e-content, e-books, and this project that. I and a, a pretty large group of other individuals and libraries have joined in on to deal with some of this. So, like, this is a huge issue, and and we know it's just going to get bigger and bigger, right? All these eBooks, all of this stuff going on here, um, and you know, I do lots of presentation about presentations about eBook trends, but really, it's about eContent because an eBook is uh, for, uh, several different formats of zeros and ones. And e-content, like music or videos or games, it, it's just zeros and ones. So we're really talking about a way for libraries to get zeros and ones to people more effectively. Frankly, that's what we're talking about. And the larger umbrella for that, in my mind, is e-content. Short, of course, for electronic content. So let's talk about how thinking about this challenge. Here, so I'm, I'm telling you a story about a project, right? <laughs> so let's thinking about uh, e-content and how. Now, I haven't showed you the numbers. That would be other presentations, and many of us have seen them, about how the projections for how many more people are going to be accessing content electronically and what that means for libraries. The impact is going to be gigantic uh, in the next decade. Uh, so let's talk about this with the what-if version. Well, you know, happily, there's lots of things we can all agree on. Technology makes libraries more relevant and useful. Uh, and we've talked about this already as well. Communities need libraries to thrive. Um, but when we look at how we get e-content right now, uh, we just know that we need new solutions. And these solutions need to be substantial, they need to be highly functional, they need to be practical, and they need to be new, they need to be different than what we have right now. And a lot of people are saying when it comes to e-content, now, 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 these solutions, oh, we need them right now. Uh, but the challenge for libraries, of course, as we all know, is whatever we do, we have to do it really well. So we can't just jump in and just do, uh, just freak out because uh, that's not going to work for our patrons. Uh, at the same time, the current methods that we use, that we have to use to acquire e-content, they're unnecessarily expensive and inefficient. They truly are uh, very expensive, very inefficient, and truthfully, very unsustainable. Imagine that you're going to have to rebuild your collection electronically. Imagine that. That is a huge task. And if we're paying twice the cost, of a of a of playing tw twice as much as it costs for us to buy a print book to buy an ebook. Uh, first of all, that's completely broken. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Uh, second of all, uh, there's no way in the world we're going to even be able to start rebuilding our entire collections electronically, or you know, not entirely, but large swaths of our collection electronically, if it costs twice as much as a book. And we're starting not from scratch, but many of us from scratch, and many of us close to scratch. This just is not going to work. And what that means is that the format evolution for electronic content requires a new approach. And above, right, we see the, you know, the, the old phone, the VHS tapes, typewriter, and really the issue here is money. Money is an issue. Um, so we believe this this format evolution it, it just requires a new infrastructure and different systems than we have in place right now. So talking about how to renew yourself, your library, and your career, and the fact that I believe that you can do it, you can take a project that you can do it. Well, what if? There we go. Ha ha. What if uh, instead of when we think about control, 
and how and this could be for electronic content, right? This gigantic thing that dozens of people are working on. This could be for a single project that's something fun or funky or desperately needed at your library that you want to take on that you'll be really engaged and excited about. What if instead of thinking about control and how we just don't have enough control, what if we actually realized, let's just say from the library renewal perspective, that if we banded together, if there are more libraries in the US than there are Starbucks or McDonald's, we have huge amounts of power and it's right at our fingertips. We just have to figure out how to come together and this, this word sounds bad, exploit, but it's in a good way, exploit our shared power to the benefit of our communities, to the, to the furthering of our missions. It, this is possible. This can actually happen. I would say if you have a project where you want to do something, okay, so look, before I, when I was in the circulation department at that library I, I told you about before I went to library school and I wanted to go into children's, I wanted to do a display and I was allowed to work on a display. Because I was in art school, right? It was something I liked. So I picked a project that I really liked. No, I, I sort of stumbled onto that. Um, I was a little restless and wanted to do something that I thought would be fun, truthfully. That's, that's where that came from. Now, hopefully I've matured a little bit and can share stories like this, too. But the example is there nonetheless. In that instance, that thing worked. Now, you might not be able to do that at your library. I get that. But there are other things that you could do. And you know what? You could even do these in your free time if you had to. Because a bunch of projects that I've had to work on have been in my free time. Or I've decided to work on I've been in my free time. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about what if. So what if, uh, thinking about, let's just say, electronic content and what Library Renewal works on, we realize that together we have huge amounts of power. And what if we decided to come together in a new way um, and made our own organization? What if we did that? Uh, and what if that organization was controlled by libraries? and had a mission to further the mission of libraries as it relates to e-content, it's pretty exciting. Uh, it would able, enable, it's enabled us so far to get a whole bunch of traction, lots of presentations and you know, mentions in library press. And um, you know, Right now, though, we are seeking uh, partners. We're seeking more partners, um, library partners and funding partners, because it takes money to do this. But the ultimate point is that we want to get more money for rights holders and uh, I just lost one of my screens here. Oh, there we go. Okay, I thought maybe I lost you. We want to get more money for rights holders, publishers, yep. and huge savings for libraries. Um, that's what we're aspiring for. And we believe, after a couple of years of work on this and research and planning and setting us up as a 501c3, that it's only possible through an organization that's transparent, that's library-run, that's expert, that's a nonprofit, and that's absolutely committed to the mission of libraries. So if you want to know, we have a couple more things to talk about, but if you want to know more about library renewal or this story, contact us, you know, partner with us, get a hold of us. We're here. We're ready. We're able to talk with you about all this stuff. And it doesn't have to be about this stuff. It could be about your project. Um, so in turn, uh, I see, you know, this may be a... Uh, uh, not the best term to use, half glass full, half glass empty, but I see our work as, as, as definitely glasses half full. So let's, we're working up towards our conclusion here. So what if, instead of saying stop, no, I can't do this. What if instead of saying, no, stop, I can't do this. Oh, no, wait, no, 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 no. You don't get it, no, no, no. What if, and I will tell you, when I started working on this stop thing, the stop sign the metaphor or the analogy or whatever it is the best word for it, um, this is the first thing I thought of. I, I've tried really hard to train my brain <laughs> to not go to that bad place. Sometimes it still good, does. I get it. I'm trying to be realistically optimistic. But the first thing I thought was of this graffiti on stop signs, <laughs> which is funny, right? Humor is a really useful thing to keep you realistically optimistic, by the way, <laughs> as I'm sure all of you know. Um, I thought of this, and then I thought of this. I really did, because I'd seen these signs before. And <laughs> Also, it fits in with the idea of, you know what, look, I can actually do some stuff. I really, really, I don't have to say stop. I can say stop, collaborate, listen, like, don't stop believing. And, you know, I, look, I, you know, I, you may think this is a little cheesy, but, you know, really, in, for me, a lot of the motivation is about love. And, and, you know, there are lots of different kinds of love, but we love our communities, and we love what our libraries do. Um, and, and. We're not going to stop doing that. And one of the ways to make sure that you don't get completely fried or burnt out 
or feel beat down or feel like you can't work on the things that you know the library really needs to work on is to take the challenge that I've given you. And that challenge is find a project that you're really excited about and motivated about and make a plan for it and think on it and refine your plan and then do it. So what if, what if all of that happened? What if your project came together? What if Library Renewal actually takes off and works and does all this great stuff? What if you do another project after this first project and a second and third project? Some of them won't work, some of them will work. What if all of that happens? Well, that's very refreshing. That's, my, that's what this slide is here to show you. That would be so refreshing. That would be really great. So again, I dare you to come up with an idea, something you really want to do at your library, you're really excited about, a little groundbreaking maybe, a little different. And then I challenge you to make a strategy tactics and the timeline for this idea, for this thing you want to do in your library, and write it down. Keep thinking about it. It's like a little bit of a hobby almost. And then refine those plans. Keep, keep all of this in your head. Don't say stop. Go. You. You. Go do it. So that's the end of my presentation. If you want to get a hold of me to talk about any of this stuff, you can get me at info at librarynewal.org. And you can visit Library Renewal at librarynewal.org uh, on the web. Uh, I'm not sure how we're doing with time. Let me. I was sort of in the zone there. It looks like no, that's we're okay. right on the hour. I'm happy to stay if anybody has questions. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I'm happy to stay if anybody has questions. So um, feel free or I can say adios mm -hmm. and thank you. No, that's right fine. The sunset. <laughs> no, that's fine. We can stay as long as whatever people um, need. Um, we're not picky about stopping right on the hour. Um, it's, you know, I'm in charge here, so whatever. We do whatever <laughs> it needs. <laughs> um, All right, boss. Yeah. <laughs> um, at the very beginning of this presentation, you sh you um, mentioned the other Michael Porter, who is, um, as you said, more of a religious, inspirational um, speaker. Yeah. Um, and you said, I'm not him, I'm not him. Um, and that's true, obviously, you're not him, but you're definitely an inspirational speaker. <laughs> um, cause that this, yeah, this presentation was awesome, yes, with, I mean, ideas and thoughts and opening minds about what to do and what you can do and just try. It doesn't hurt to try and ask and say, hey, how about this? And, um, if it doesn't work, you know, failure's okay too. Try something else. Try again. That's part of the strategy that you were talking about. Yep. Be um, brave. Yeah. Have fun. Experiment mm -hmm. and play to your strengths. Yep. And we do have some comments, not actual questions though, but that came in through um, the, the system. Um, and early in the presentation, actually, is um, someone uh -oh. said, "No, no, it's okay." Say, you stink. No, not <laughs> um, not publicly. No. Um, <laughs> Um, someone said, I have recently been told, this is someone from a college library, I have recently been told by my admissions to focus only on the base essential of my one-person library. But, she says, I love the idea of going rogue and working under the radar. So I think you've inspired her to say, the heck with that, I'm going to try something anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, some of you may have seen a, a couple videos that David King and I did. Um, mm -hmm. One was called Hi-Fi Sci-Fi Library and the other was called Library 101. And we did all of those in our free time. We wanted to learn how to make better video. We wanted to play around with audio. David does music. We wanted to goof around. We wanted to have fun. We wanted to really dive into like how to do the lighting and the sets. Now, we also do presentations about video too, right? So we parlay that into something that's useful. And we've used the equipment that we bought for those videos to do other videos. David's got some consulting gigs from it. We've taken mm -hmm. them to conferences and shot some videos. So you get as much value out of the work that you do. So I guess the reason I'm saying all we wrote articles in Computers and Libraries Magazine and Public Libraries Magazine about the video projects that we did. The reason I'm saying all of that is because you might have to do some stuff under the radar like we did with those video projects because mm -hmm. it just wasn't our job. We had different jobs, but mm -hmm. we wanted to learn stuff and we wanted to try to help people and spread some you know good stuff around while we were learning. And then we got tons of benefit out of it, truthfully. Uh, through the writing and the exposure and, and all that. And we, you know what? We had fun. It was a lot of hard work. And, it, you know, we had to pay for some stuff. But it was. Mm -hmm. It was under the radar. It's it's similar to doing, um, in many, any any profession, you need to do your own um, 
personal um, professional development and it's not always going to be on work time or paid for or supported by your work but if you want to keep going in your career and advancing keeping on top of things you very often have to do it on your own outside and that's just part of keeping your what you're doing going and eventually that can work back itself back into your actual job if you're lucky I, I it absolutely has for me and just mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of my colleagues and friends I, I would also say though Krista, I know there are lots of folk that uh, they work part-time, they run their library, they work there part-time, maybe, or maybe they work full-time, and it's just, that's their day job. And mm -hmm. I would say, even for those folks that aren't going to go do their personal professional development, which truthfully is something we all need to be doing, um, I agree, I like, the, you phrased it just perfectly, you used personal professional development as well as professional <laughs> development that you do at work. But mm -hmm. uh, those folks that aren't going to do any personal professional development, this can still work because you can do this at work. You can right, get yeah. motivated to start a new project. So I was trying to show respect for people who are mm -hmm. in that position, but also motiv help you know motivate folks to, to try some stuff mm -hmm. too if they were in that position. Yeah, it can work both ways, yeah. yeah. Um, another yeah. comment from um, actually I believe one of our – I'm looking here – Oh, librarian here in Nebraska. I believe, um, she said just just a comment that thank you. It was a very nice pick me up for a Wednesday morning. <laughs> so good for you. Thank you very much. And then um, I'm not sure if this is good or bad. Um, here at the Library Commission, we have staff that will get together and watch our Encompass Live shows um, in a separate meeting room so they can watch and see what's going on. And um, Michael Sowers, who is our technology innovation librarian here, is in a room there. And he has commented and said, uh, darn you, Michael, meaning you, Michael, I've come up with an idea. And it involves you, Krista. So um, we'll, see what, oh boy. <laughs> we'll see what you've gotten me into. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, sort of that story and me being here is another example of how, you know, you try a project and other things can come from it. You try enough projects and things start to happen from that momentum. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like the universe magically aligns. It's like, you know, you create opportunity through your hard work at, and this is a sort of a stepping stone to get those sorts of things happen. So the reason I'm here today mm -hmm. is because I started working on stuff like this years ago and slowly building a presentation, a, a, you know, capacity to actually get a career out of doing some presentations and met folks like you and Michael Sowers. And I've actually presented with Michael uh, mm -hmm. before. So, and, and you know, so then here we are on Encompass Live. Uh, it's, it, you know, it takes mm -hmm. time and you got to stick with it, but if you do that, and you know you let your sort of pure motivation show through and what you're really about and you have fun while you're doing it because you're working on stuff you like uh, you know it's it stuff comes together you, you know you you don't you create your own luck mm -hmm, absolutely okay it doesn't look like any other um, urgent questions or comments have come through while we've been chatting so um, unless you have anything else you need to uh, want to say to wrap up or you maybe already have Michael no I'm, I'm done I just yeah. want to thank okay. everybody for their time and attention <laughs> thank you very much mm -hmm. well thank you so much for being on the show with us today um, like I said you're not a um, religious inspirational speaker but you're definitely inspirational oh, thanks. <laughs> and, and I think there's going to be a lot of response uh, coming out of this in in the future near future and like you said it can take time and effort in a long time but in far future as well okay Just keep at it yeah absolutely all right thank you very much michael i'm going to yep, um steal back control you can just um from you there we go so um thank you michael and thank you everyone for attending this morning um, the session was recorded, and the recording will be available sometime later today or tomorrow for everyone to watch afterwards. Uh, and I will invite you to join us next week on Encompass Live, where our topic will be about your government online, um, the executive branch and cabinet. This is actually the first of a three-part series that our uh, Laura Johnson, who's our continuing education coordinator here at the Library Commission, is doing on government websites that are out there for you and how what kind of information is in them and how you can access them and use them. Um, for your work. So she's going to start off here with the executive branch in the cabinet next week on Wednesday morning. So I hope you will join us for that. 
Um, and as you can see here also, we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So please feel free to please go to uh, Facebook and like our page there. And you will also, via Encompass Live, receive updates and notifications of whenever we have new sessions coming and when the recordings are available and reminders of, uh, for example, of today's session um, show that was on. So um, like us on the Facebook page and that will help you keep up with what we are doing on Encompass Live. So other than that, I think we are done for this morning. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.